Let's do the show on the road. Okay, it's 5.30. This time I'll call our monthly uh, Board of Commissioner meeting to order. And I'll ask that uh, you stand for the invocation by Commissioner Langley and the Pledge of Allegiance by Commissioner Evans. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we are grateful and thankful for this moment in time. We are grateful, Lord, that you have allowed us to assemble here to do the business of your county. God, we just ask your continued blessings and guidance upon us, Father, and keep us safe from the approaching storm. And God, let your peace be in this meeting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with this time I ask that you silence your cell phone if you've not already done that. Uh, item number C is conflict of interest disclosure. Is there any commissioner that would like to uh, make a disclosure at this time? If not, we'll move to uh, item number D, the approval of the agenda. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Raise your right hand. Those opposed? Okay, at this time uh, we're going to have the uh, Hurricane Florence update by Carney. And we're going to like Carney to go ahead and do his other two items uh, on the agenda because these gentlemen have another conference call with the state, is that correct? Two more conference calls and then meet with our chiefs at 8 o'clock. Okay, so we're going to let you do all three at, at this time. I, I want to start off by uh, letting Chris kind of give a uh, situation or I'm looking at exactly where we are storm-wise and then I'm going to finish by telling you what we've done so far where our plans are. Okay, that okay, Chris. Good afternoon, commissioners. I just want to take a couple minutes to update you on where we are. Chris, how about bringing that microphone up a little bit? Okay. This, this way? Yep. All right. We just wanted to take a couple minutes to bring you up to date on where we are with the storm, some knowns, and some unknowns at this time. So let's talk about the knowns first. Uh, we're pretty confident that this storm's going to make landfall somewhere in the Wilmington and Moorhead City area. We're pretty confident that it's going to be a Category 3 or 4 when it makes landfall. We know that it's going to slow down as it approaches our coast and as it moves across our state, we're confident it is going to stall somewhere in the area of our North Carolina Virginia border. Those are the knowns that is consistent through all the forecast models up to this point. Now the unknowns that, that the forecast models are, are varying on, <coughs> literally half of the models give two paths as this storm crosses North Carolina. The first path is a more westerly path, very similar to what Hurricane Fran took when it came across our state. Uh, it will approach through Wilmington to go between Charlotte and Raleigh across the Piedmont and potentially stall in the area of Greensboro or over the Blue Ridge Parkway in the mountain areas. Uh, that is the best case scenario for us because it limits our time in hurricane force winds it minimizes our storm surge and minimizes our, our precipitation as a result of the storm. The second path that models are indicating are more of a path similar to Isabel, where it makes landfall in the Wilmington Moorhead area. It travels the 17 Highway 11 corridor north and stalls above us somewhere around the Virginia border in that area. That is our worst case scenario for the two storms. In that particular scenario, it increases our uh, duration in hurricane force winds, it maximizes our storm surge, and it gives us the greatest chance of precipitation. So timing on that path and when it takes that turn is going to be critical for us to monitor as we go through tomorrow and Wednesday to even get an idea of what impacts we're going to have. This timeline that you see here is a graph depicting when we can expect tropical storm force winds. Uh, so the areas in red are, and purple are greater than a 70% chance. So looking at this piece, uh, by Wednesday night after sunset into Thursday a.m., our conditions are going to begin to deteriorate. Now this timeline may change by some hours, depending on how slow this storm uh, slow approaches our coast. The bigger piece to keep in mind is the path as it crosses the 
the state and where it stalls. Where it stalls is going to be important. Every forecast model we see for precipitation of where it stalls is estimating between 10 and 20 inches of rain for that area. So if it stalls in the Greensboro Mountain area, uh, we're dealing with water runoff several days later, but not a direct uh, rain event for us. Uh, if it stalls in our northern, takes the 17 round and stalls just north of us, we're going to be subject to a lot of rain. So that's the knowns and the unknowns that, that we have about the storm right now. We're still a long ways from getting any prediction of storm surge, the exact amount of rain and winds we can even expect here in Dover County. Probably will not start to get that information until midday tomorrow. So those are, are what we're monitoring as we go through tonight and tomorrow and we'll taking into consideration for our plans. Any questions on the storm, the conditions, or, or anything that I might be able to answer? Anyone? Okay. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Coney for an update of our actions. Chris, if you will, turn that light. Yes, sir. Back on. Thank you, Chris. So um, we've been monitoring, of course, through the weekend uh, what's been going on, uh, what the potential was with this. This morning, first thing early, we started with our control group, um, uh, just looking and starting to, to map out our plans. Um, we have uh, issued at 3.30 today a voluntary evacuation um, for Beaufort County. And the reason for that, we did not issue that just for low-lying areas. but. Despite where this storm takes place, where it's going to come on land, we were told today on an individual call with the National Weather Service that we will experience Category 4 uh, storm pieces. And for our emergency operations plan, when we have a hurricane that's a Category 4 or 5, it asks for an evacuation of our county. So we ask for a voluntary evacuation of that today. We're still going to be watching, monitoring over the next 24 hours, again, gaining intel um, to exactly what is going on with the storm and make sure there's no other changes. We started briefing through our department heads, um, making sure everybody is, is storming and uh, preparedness-wise with their equipment ready, ready for the long haul, topping off fuel, all the, the normal things that would go into place. We've been on constant calls with state emergency management, national weather service. We will put in a request for certain resources already to come in and do a key overhead team. Also um, requested a few other high clearance vehicles and a swift water rescue team. Um, all of that looking as we get further into <coughs> Wednesday. We plan right now that at Wednesday at 8 a.m. we'll open up our emergency operations center completely and then that will remain open through the, the time of the storm. Um, we, we've had a, a good conversation in our control group. That was Matt Rowley, good. Um, Chairman Waters and, and the Sheriff's Office and our office and looking just at an overall condition of the county and as we move forward with this. Um, we will be briefing with our municipalities tomorrow morning. We'll also have another briefing in the morning with other agency representatives, all the agencies that come together and help us in the storm. So a lot of meetings, a lot of things going on, a lot of planning that's already in place and uh, we'll continue putting those, those plans in place as our emergency operations procedure says. So with that, again, just like Chris said, we're glad to answer any questions you may have. Does anyone have a question? I, I have a question. Is there any, do you have any uh, anticipation of what the winds could be in this area? It's Sustained. It's a possible to 120, 130 mile an hour winds. Sustained. With category four. Mm -hmm. And again, exactly what it'll be, that we, we just don't know yet. I mean, that is, that is. <clears throat> this is a very serious storm for Boca County. And um, I feel like because we haven't had a storm this year, we were, we were very fortunate last year with some scares. But I wanted to be clear, this is a significant threat to Beaufort County and our community. Yes. So, Councilman, on the common question we're given, exactly what will we be experiencing for Boca County? There's, there's variables at play right now it's hard to predict on that piece we we're not an office and i think you guys have found from your experience we're not an office to raise a red flag and our red flag doesn't need to be raised this storm has enough variables that have not given us answers to our questions yet that we're erring on the side of caution 
we're preparing for the worst and praying for the best. Uh, so a lot of the actions that we're taking, at this point we have no choice but to assume we're going to get the worst. And that's the way our response is going to be driven until we have to scale it back. Uh, it's a little opposite of what we normally do again. We're not going to raise red flags, but in this case there's too many unknowns for us not to. Any other questions? I think that's all right. You want to move to the next? Yes, sir. With your permission, I'll move into a couple of other items. Um, you know, I, I get first of all to um, read a resolution about September 11th. Um, and I'd like to read that to you now as it seems our emergency responders are really gearing up uh, over the next few days. It says, First Responders Day Resolution, September 11th, 2018. Whereas first, res first responders provide a vital and public service throughout Beaufort County. And whereas the first responders in Beaufort County include all fire, police, EMS, sheriff's deputies, and emergency 911 call takers who provide such services. And whereas the first responders in Beaufort County are ready to provide life-saving services to those in need 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Whereas first responders work devotedly and selfishly on behalf of the people of this county, regardless of the peril or hazard to themselves. And whereas in emergency situations, first responders carry out the critical role of protecting and ensuring public safety. And whereas our first responders are called upon in the event of a natural disaster, such as hurricanes, wildfires, and tornadoes. And whereas countless both county, county citizens have benefited from the courageous services of first responders across our county. And whereas Beaufort County citizens, workers, and visitors benefit daily from the knowledge and skills of these highly trained individuals. Now therefore be it resolved that the Beaufort County Board of Commissioners does hereby acknowledge September 11, 2018 as First Responders Day and heartily thanks our first responders for all they do. Be it further resolved that the Beaufort County Board of Commissioners encourages communities to observe First Responders Day with appropriate ceremonies and activities adopted this 10th day of September 2018. And, and with that resolution, I would just like to say that our volunteerism is a very hard thing and it's a thing that suffers greatly from people. We have so many individual responsibilities that people go through today. And I would just like to say to those listening, if you have an urge that you want to go to the community, I'm sure the agency you're close by would love to have you be involved. Could I uh, have a motion to approve? Got a motion to approve and a second. All those in favor of the uh, resolution, raise your right hand. Anybody opposed? Okay. I uh, had a request. If we can back up, uh, and I would ask uh, Chief Rose if he would step up. Commissioner Buzio wanted to comment about anything that's going on uh, as far as the, the Sheriff's Department in preparation for the storm. We've been monitoring the storm for about the last week. Um, we well, we take it as uh, you know, just part of our normal operations, just to be operational ready at any given time. So there's a lot of there's not a lot of things that have to change going into a storm week. Um, but we have uh, gone through a check of this. We make sure that our equipment is is up and running. You'll see that you know all of our trucks will be moving around and we'll be in the areas that we may be um, as the waters start to rise. Um, we um, affected our schedule to make sure that we are ready to operate through the storm and for the next two or three weeks after the storm and any response or recovery. Um, we've done all of our um, procedures and protocols when it comes to uh, our, our inmates and the detention facility um, and all of our personnel that we have under our command. So we're, we're ready for anything that comes up. But if there's any specific questions or anything like that, I'll be, be ready to answer. Sure. Yes. Uh, Chief, is uh, are we moving the prisoners out of the jail? Uh, as as of right now, uh, we are scheduled to have a full evacuation of the jail uh, pending. You know that is subject to change up to late Wednesday. Uh, but but up until then, uh, unless something does change that uh, that will impact the storm track, um, our, our inmates will be transported to DAC sometime before Wednesday evening. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Under what weather conditions will the sheriff's department shut down operations? Um, well, we 
since I've been at the sheriff's office, we go if we can. You know, if, if unless there is absolute um, chance or more chance that we will injure ourselves or others responding, then if, if we get called to an area and we can get there, then we will go. Who makes that determination? Um, well, a lot, a lot of people make that determination. Um, the sheriff himself, on down to the individual responders that are that actually have their eyes on on what's going on in front. Of them. I don't really consider that to be an answer because if the wind's blowing 75 miles an hour, are you going? If we can go, we're going to go. Thank you. You're very well. Thank you, Charlie. I appreciate the uh, the comments and it shows that you just like Connie's office and uh, first responders and you know you're well prepared for uh, for the storm. Yes, sir. And prepared, both of you prepared for the uh, safety of the residents. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Carney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, I have one other item. Uh, it is the item for decision adoption of revised Beaufort County EMS system oversight ordinance. You should have had for uh, you attached both a copy of the old and the new. The old had uh, wherever there was a change highlighted in yellow, and the new what that change was highlighted in blue. Most of these changes were work changes or grammatical uh, changes that had to do with our office changing from emergency management to Department of Emergency Services. It also had to do with some verbiage from where the original oversight was from the first meeting forward of how uh, the first officers were installed and we removed some of that language. And lastly, there was a five-year exemption of uh, removal for a few of the non-transporting agencies and that's been re removed because that time would be up by the time this new ordinance was in place. So entertain any questions you may have uh, about these changes. Does uh, any commissioner have a question? I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Got a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor of the uh, Changes to the EMS system oversight ordinance, raise your right hand. Thank you, gentlemen. And thank you, thank you and Chris and the other ones for what you're doing and uh, be safe. Thank you very much yeah. for allowing us to go ahead and present. All right, at this time uh, we have two public hearings. Uh, the uh, first one uh, is the petition to name a road off of Voice of America Road. Uh, Need a motion to move into the public hearing. So moved. Got a motion. Second. And a second. All those in favor of going into the the uh, public hearing, raise your right hand. Okay, Justin. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Um, we have uh, two petitions before you this evening. Uh, the first one. Um, you mentioned this is for uh, Mr. Keith Manning. This is to uh, name a uh, road off of VOA road of approximately uh, 1,050 feet in length. Um, in your packet, you'll see the location of this uh, proposed roadway. Um, you'll see on the map that uh, currently there is a existing 50-foot easement um, at the location. Um, you also see that as you go back off of VOA road down this easement where the proposed uh, road would be at, um, you'll notice that there are going to be it appears four structures that are located back there so that meets the requirements of the two or more structures. Uh, Mr. Manning submitted the name request uh, to us. Uh, we run those by uh, addressing uh, the first two address, first two names that were requested. Uh, they were either sound alikes or matched uh, current roadways in the county. Uh, so those uh, were denied. The uh, last name, though, Ponderosa Road, um, that had, did not have any sound alikes or any matches. Uh, so that one um, was was a good match for a uh, proposed road name. Uh, any questions from the commissioners? If not, is there a citizen that would like to speak at this time? We did not have anybody sign up, but okay. Uh, can I have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. So moved. Motion and a second to close the uh, public second. hearing. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All right. Now we're going to go into the public hearing. Uh, the petition to name a road off of Carroll uh, Road. So, can I have a motion and a second? Mm -hmm. Got a motion and a second. 
uh, to open the public hearing. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Okay, so we're now into the uh, public hearing. So turn it over to you, Justin. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, petition for road name, as you mentioned, this is located off of uh, Caro Road in Chocowinity. Um This was submitted by Mr. Gopher Vaughn and Vicki Vaughn. Um, you'll notice uh, in your uh, agenda packet we've included the uh, survey, which uh, you'll see includes a new 50-foot easement at the location. Um, once again, they will have, I believe, three structures, three mobile home structures, uh, is my understanding, that will be going in uh, back off of this easement. So again, that would meet the uh, requirement for the number of structures that would be, uh, would be serviced by the, uh, the new roadway. Um, there were, once again, three names that were submitted. Um, in this case, uh, there were no issues with uh, any of the, uh, the names in terms of uh, matches or sound alikes. So the uh, first option in this case um, was uh, Lonesome Oak Lane. And uh, at this point, uh, our recommendation would be to approve the uh, road name as uh, Lonesome Oak Lane. Does any uh, commissioner have a question of uh, Justin? If not, we'll open it up. Uh, is there a public citizen that would like to <coughs> comment? If not, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Motion to close. Second. And a second. All those in favor of closing, please raise your right hand. Thank you very much, Justin. All right. Uh, the next item is public comments, and we have one, and uh, Mr. John Anderson. Good evening. I'm here again on behalf of Corey Anderson, who died in the custody of the sheriff in May of two, 2017. For 16 months, we've been asking the sheriff for his notification policy and also for Corey's emergency contacts. For eight months, we've come before the board seeking help uh, in getting the uh, policy and the uh, questions on the notifications, asking why the sheriff didn't call the family. We're still waiting. For eight months, uh, no one has lifted a finger to help. Uh, no one among you guys have lifted a finger to help us except for Hood. Uh, as far as the policy, we have good reason to believe there's a policy because uh, Chief Deputy Rose has stated in a letter from, a, from the attorney Francisco that Chief Deputy Rose says that he's given us this policy. And I'll read it. It states as follows. Uh, as best as I can determine, you're seeking to receive a copy of the sheriff's policy concerning notification of the next of kin if there is Ill illness, injury, death of an inmate such as Corey Anderson. Mr. Ed Anderson is also requesting release of Corey's inmate files. I discussed these items with Chief Deputy Rose. He assured me that these had been given to you with the exception of the medical records. So, with that being said, Chief Rose says he has given us a copy. We don't have a copy, but this does imply that there is one somewhere. Now, you guys have a copy of all this. We'll have to pack it with you tonight so you would know and you would not be uninformed as you've acted in the past like you are. Uh, and and that, that's why you don't have the answers to any of our questions just like the sheriff don't or does not. Um, tonight, the county attorney will probably read the response back from the assistant attorney general. Uh, in his response or this response, it refers to errors, and you have a copy of it, uh, where notification they think is not conferred to the sheriff. Going on to say this is not an official legal opinion from the Attorney General. That's what it says on the letter. So this holds no weight as far as we're concerned in this matter of notifying emergency contacts and calling the family when there's a serious uh, sickness or illness. Um, the board, you guys have the power to request this notification from the sheriff. Uh, and to place it in the medical plan. You have that power just like you have the power and the authority to approve the medical plan and the response ability. So what we're asking tonight as a family, we're asking you guys, the four of you that supported this before, to support, uh, to support this idea tonight of having this policy, getting the policy from the sheriff and having it placed in the medical plan. Uh, it's your responsibility and the opportunity that you have to protect the people of this county and to do the right thing, to be as good as your word, as you were before uh, when this was first brought up. Uh, so either you guys will make the choice to do that 
or either you guys will keep playing politics and covering up for the sheriff. I want it stated tonight that Eva Carmen, who is uh, with Divident Risk Management and Legal Services, has stated and verified that it's not the hospital's responsibility to call the family, nor do they have the authority to do that because they don't have the list of the emergency contacts. So it has been said before that that's. Uh, that that's uh, who called and that that was sufficient, but that is not sufficient. It is not their responsibility. So again, you've got what you need to put this in place. We're asking you to do that. The sheriff has stated that he has the policy. So we as a family, and because of Corey's death, we really can't see any reason that you guys might find not to have not not to take action and to have this placed in the medical plan, so that not only some of uh, my family but other families will be affected as well. Uh, no one should die because we're not willing to do uh, what we've been elected to do. Uh, Sheriff Coleman can get out and put up uh, political signs, uh, but he can't get out and answer questions to the public or provide public documents. What kind of elected official is that? To me and to my family, it's a, an official who doesn't care about the people because Corey was a person in this county and so are we. And it's also one who's, who's not being held account, accountable to anyone or anything. So I say again to you tonight as a board, um, are you going to be the same way as the sheriff? Are you not going to be willing to be accountable to the public? and uh, to uh, public policy and take advantage of the opportunity and take on the responsibility that you have to protect the citizens of this county or are you going to keep on playing politics? It was stated, which was very offensive to me, in the last meeting, I think it was by you, Mr. Waters, it may have been by somebody else, but I believe it was by you. You said that this is all about politics. I want you to know tonight, it, this is not about politics. It's never been about politics. This is about my nephew who died in the custody of the Beaufort County Jail. It should have never happened, and I hope and pray that it never happens to anybody again. So this isn't about politics, and I don't appreciate that being said. And I want you to know, it was also said that we wouldn't be seen after the election. I can promise you, until we get our answers, I will be back, we will be back, and we will continue to seek the answers that we need and to see that some kind of policy gets put in place so that not only Corey's death will be vindicated and justified, but anybody else who is an inmate in the Beaufort County Jail, that they will be taken care of as they should, and nobody else will have to go through what we've been through, what we're still going through, and what my brother is going through especially because it was his son and it was my nephew. Thank you for your time tonight, and God bless you. Thank you. <clears throat> At this time, we uh, move into item uh, H, uh, and under that is the NC, the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners Peer Review Study of our Tax Department, and I'll turn that over to you, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. As you'll recall, at your regular meeting on March the 12th, 2018, uh, the board unanimously approved asking the association to perform a peer review study of the tax department. Uh, Mr. Neil Emery, who is with the association outreach associate and a retired county manager, is here to make that presentation to discuss with you what that study will entail and the process in which they'll go about it. So I'll turn it over to Neil. reminds me of old times but <laughs> as an old retired manager but now let me begin by first thanking you for the opportunity to be here this evening I want to thank you mr. chairman your fellow board members uh, we always appreciate the opportunity to come before our members from the association and I bring greetings from Kevin Leonard our director and our staff there uh, we appreciate all you do for our association and y'all's willingness to give time to our association in the efforts of the other 99 counties in our state so thank you so much and I think I saw most of you in Hickory so hope you had we had a good annual meeting there and we enjoyed that and I think it's always good for counties to come together uh, but tonight I want to talk to you about the uh, resource teams this is something we do and something we offer to counties that have an interest uh, as we all know we can all learn from each other and that can definitely be true in our county departments and so our, our association has had a long history of when a county sees a need that we are willing to come in with a team of uh, peers as well as experts to look at that operation and see how you might better it for your citizens. 
Uh, in this case, in most cases, it'll involve the association will lead as a lead person for it. In our case, it'll be David Baker. Some of you may be aware of David. He was uh, a leader in the leadership of the Department of Revenue, but now he works for our association. Uh, he couldn't be with us this evening because of another commitment, but he will be the lead person on this, and he definitely has the background and the knowledge to lead that effort. Uh, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. It, it also will involve the North Carolina Department of Revenue, the expertise they bring is from the Avalorum Tax Division. They will be a key part of that uh, team, as well as the School of Government. Uh, and then finally, sometimes I think most importantly, would be peer tax offices in this area for different areas. And, and that will be David that helps put that team together. Those may be a neighboring county or maybe it's totally somewhere else in the state, but some peer tax administration folks that can come down and take sometimes it's good to just have another look, set of eyes on the issue and that's what they bring to the table because they definitely have a part of that um, as a as a retired manager i want to share with you my experience with this and as during my time in harney county we actually utilized them for just this type of study a tax office study and i can't say enough about from the county side how beneficial it was to have that different set of eyes and sometimes we all get caught up and well that's just the way we've always done it and this gives you that opportunity to review that and see how you might better serve your citizens and it's one that we do it together and we're here to help each other so i can testify personally that it can be a good experience and one that can be beneficial to your operation and you know the tax office is the lifeblood of what how you fund all the services you provide your citizens uh, it's going to be an objective look it's going to be a comprehensive look and i say that comprehensive look because sometimes we think well we're going to send a group over there to go find if there's problems in the tax office no we're going to have a group that sees that looks at it from several objectives one will be the type thing will be the structure of the tax office how you have it as a board how you've determined it's best administered at the tax office which is a discussion and a decision you make as a board it's going to look at the policies and practices of the tax office team is going to explore those and see how they may compare to other counties or how they how those policies were put in place how effective those policies are and that could range from delinquent taxes to present use value to just a wide multitude of issues that, that you look at as a county and how that compares to maybe other counties it's going to look at staffing uh, I remember when my board went through it we found out real quick we had issues and one of the issues we had was we didn't have enough people in the tax office carried out how we wanted it done and how we wanted the citizens served. not saying that would be the case here but it is an issue that's looked at what is the staffing and having the people capable of, of carrying out the mission of the tax office and then finally capital needs uh, what do they need in that office to do their job what tools do they need do they have the tools they need uh, do they have what they need to carry out the mission of the tax office so all those things are going to be looked at and I bring that up because sometimes when the report comes back it will have a section about what you need to do as a board for the it may be nothing but it may be a list of things that the board needs to do whether you need to change your structure where you need to invest in the office whether you need to invest in new equipment or just what it may be those are th those are going to be incorporating this so I try to point that out so that boards are aware when this report comes it's not just going to be those that actually directly work in the tax office there'll be responsibilities others may have to meet because you can't really affect the plan and put it forward without having all pieces. You can't expect the tax office to solve all the issues. It may be some of the issues have to be solved from other offices. So I just want to bring that out. The uh, how this will work, and I just want to quickly go to the process. I know you probably have a full agenda. Uh, the team will be assembled by David, as I noted. He will put together the people he thinks, with, in consultation with your folks, uh, staying in touch with Brian in the county manager's office, letting you know who's going to be coming in on this team. Uh, the normal practice they would come here would be someone represent Department of Revenue, the School of Government, and again, other counties and other tax offices. They will actually come to the county and spend time in the office. They will visit with it may be from IT issues to policy issues to they want to meet with the staff that actually collects that money or that person who actually does that tax listing or that person that goes out and does audits or they're going to talk to staff and try to get a sense of what's going on in the operation and what the strengths and weaknesses may be and they're going to each be assigned to their strength 
and there'll be each member of the team would be charged with writing up a portion of that study. Then that team will come together and develop a plan of action uh, for the county and put that together and it will be presented back to the board at a future meeting uh, in which we'll lay out the findings of that study. Uh, it's not a finger pointing study and it's not going to be. It's going to simply look at operations, needs, and what steps could be taken to address those. And that's going to be laid out to this board who ultimately is the ultimate authority to see if that's how you might want to carry that out. Uh, but we will be coming back to present it to you. It is, uh, it's not a real expensive study. It's the only thing we, we may ask the county to pay some of the travel expenses of the of the staff that may come from other counties. Because you know how them commissioners can be in other counties. They don't want to pay travel to come. No, but, but that's the only cost it would be. It's just a service the association provides and one that I know firsthand can be a positive. If everyone goes into it open-minded and recognize it, that we may all have a seat at the table of finding the solutions, it can be a great process and really accomplish what you want. So I'm going to stop there at that point and only simply tell you in the coming weeks in coordination with the tax office and how it fits their schedules, David will be bringing that team together and he will be scheduling with your staff when is the appropriate time to come. And hopefully they will put that study together and have it in the coming months you'll be seeing us return with that study to present it to the board. So I'll be happy to entertain any questions you may have. City uh, Commissioner, I have a question of uh, Deal. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Emery, uh, you mentioned about policies. So I, I assume what you meant on that is that you're going to review our policies that we have in that office? Yes, related to the tax. And uh, in reviewing it, if we're missing any policies, you'll make recommendations? Absolutely. And the ones you do review, uh, you'll make comments on each one? They will, I will say, not that they might, but if there's any area that needs improvement, they would comment that's on right, that. That's, yes. Uh, that will be the, or if it's missing something or. That's the intent, is to look and see if there's a weakness in a policy or need is a policy may be out of date. Is there a way to improve it? Or we're missing it? one. Oh, we're missing one. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So, Mr. Evans. Uh, the timing, when would you, to prove, I guess, when you, would you start? And when do you think the actual start to finish? We have to talk about deadline date. We'd rather do it right than do it in time, but hopefully in the next two to three months. Because they, once that team hits, they'll want to come in and do it and get it done. And, and uh, they'll spend a day here, uh, but they'll still be communicating in other ways. And they'll write that up pretty quick. So I, give us out 90 days. I'm sorry to finish? Yes. Okay. I think that's reasonable. If, we, if there's a change in that, we'll communicate that to Brian. If there's a hold up in that, we'll surely let you know. So you're looking at probably coming back to the commissioners in January, I would say. I would hope by the close of the end of the year we could be back. I don't know how the holidays will play out in that, but uh, we don't. I don't know if that would be a gift to bring you or not, a tax office. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Richard. As a part of your process, are you going to be talking and interviewing with commissioners? No. That's not being a part now. If this board directs it, we want us to, but we, we've not, in the operation of the tax office, don't see what the role of the commissioner is other than appointing the tax administrator and the tax collector. But if you, if, if that's something you desire, I mean, we're going we're gonna to make it work for both the county. Well, I think you should. Why would you? Hmm? Why would you? I'm not. If you tell us what type of questions you'd like to ask, we could arrange that to ask those questions of each board member. Don't ask me I, I would say if a commissioner has some concerns that that they may want you to take a look at, that they send an email to Brian and let Brian forward those for consideration by the team. And that, I'll be happy to communicate with the team. If there's a commissioner here that wants to meet with a representative of the team, maybe David, or, and we'll sit down and arrange that. I mean, we want everybody to leave this process to feel like they've had the opportunity to have their say and have their input. Uh, so whatever works best. And if Mr. Richardson wants sure. us to come and meet with him, we'll be I'd happy. I'd like to meet. I think okay. be careful that we don't influence the study. I, I'd like to see what they have to say about our operations. So I have no intention. Mm -hmm. To, That's the normal. I don't want to influence what you may or may not find. 
I think the group. If you're experienced in doing this, I assume you're going to look at everything. I don't think talk to everybody. I, I don't. I don't foresee the team being influenced if they talk to one board member or two board members, because they really don't have. You know, they're independent, really free to come in and do that. And they, they, they work for the county manager. Well, then not totally in the tax office. <laughs> 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 As in any all things in county government. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Brand. Uh, I assume that once this program is put together, that we'll have a chance to look at it and, and review it and ask questions before it goes into effect. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's just a report. It's here it is, what you do with it. You might not do nothing. You might not. I mean, some counties have had them done and not enacted them. Some have done them and, and they've been great I mean what you wanted what we're trying to do is maximize your abilities and your staff to do the best job they can for the citizens collecting taxes I mean that's that's their role that's their mission and that's what we want to help them do I have one more question Mr. Chairman. yes are you gonna will you if you will you, will you look at the structure of the operation absolutely and so you'll make recommendations yes. if you need to make any recommendations if you feel that's a hindrance if the structure is a hindrance to the operation off yes we'll, okay we'll make a recommendation right. Uh, Brian, do you have any comment at all? No, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Neil. And uh, you, you didn't tell the rest of the people in the audience and on TV that you have some roots here in Buffett County. Well, if my, my wife's a Willard and she, her mama's an alley good, so that covers everybody down here, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't do everybody. Yeah. <laughs> my wife grew up on Broad Creek, so. <laughs> and since you've been coming down here, now you wish you were a Willard. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you, for, thank you for having me again. Thank you all for all you do at the association. I think I may slip out, so. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. You're excused. Okay, we're done for items for consent. Is there any item that we, that a commissioner wishes to move for further discussion? If not, well, okay. I like to have item number three, two, three, and four for discussion. Two, three, and four. Okay. Right. Can I get a motion to approve the uh, items one and five? So moved. Five, What's five? Yeah, we're five. I don't have five. We do have five. Yeah. You haven't, you haven't amended a... That's, that's the uh, minutes. What of, is it? That's the minutes. For the uh, August minutes. So moved. Got a motion to serve second. 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 All right. All those in favor of the uh, consent item, raise your right hand. Those opposed? <laughs> All right. Uh, now we're down for items for discussion. Item number J, uh, flood map update, Mr. Richardson. Well, let me do a clarification before that. Since I was looking at items two, three, and four, item four is approval on my sheet is approval of the August minutes and the workshop minutes. And that's what I was really referring to was uh, item, what is now item, I guess it's still item four. No, oh, it's item five. That the one you should be looking at it's got five on there and it has highlighted is that no I did not have this the one I'm looking at has approval no, item number four is approval of August minutes the one and you have in your hand is the uh, right I understand but I wasn't looking at that okay. when I did this so we're really talking about the purchase order project carry forwards the purchase orders and contracts which is item three and then approval of the August minutes okay not the Southern Albemarle Can we already approve one five though? Did we have we voted on that? Okay. Yes. One and five. Yes. We approved that already. Yeah, but you didn't have a legitimate agenda. I didn't have the real agenda. This was given to us. Okay. I didn't have it. It was laying here. She came and pulled it up. Normally we do an agenda, a revised agenda. You can turn those out every fifteen minutes. This is the revised agenda. Are you honorable enough to honor my request, or do you want to play politics? Okay. Uh, Which is it, Mr. Chairman? What are we doing? Well, I'll, I'll see if there's a motion. If, if, is there a motion to make the change, to approve items number one and items number four? On the revised agenda. On the revised agenda. Yeah, okay. Is there a motion? If not, motion dies. Now so you're not honorable enough. Thank uh, you very much. Now we're down to the flood map update, Commissioner Richards. 
flood update. Well, the, fl the purpose of the flood update is to ask the manager to give us a report on where we are since we sent the um, uh, lobbyist, uh, put the lobbyists on this to see what's going on. So, and this is about getting the flood maps changed in Beaufort County because there's about $5 million of, of uh, insurance premium out there that people in Beaufort County are going to benefit from when this changes. So that was the real reason for this. So, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to draw your attention to an email that, that I sent you, sent the board. Um, I followed up with Randy Munt, who is with um, North Carolina Emergency Management. He is their outreach coordinator for the risk management section that deals with the flood mapping. Um, you'll note in that that it appears now that the schedule has slipped uh, to the second quarter of 2019. Um, in his email, he wrote that the revised preliminary maps should be issued in September of 18 based on comments and appeals received during the first statutory 90-day appeal period, which took place 8-17 of 17 through 11-14 of 17. So there was an initial piece that was put out there on the preliminary maps. They received comments, and then they had, a, they had to uh, receive um, a 30-day period after that. It says the revised maps have a 30-day statutory comment period after they're published. After this request for the letter of final determination can be submitted to FEMA for issuance. Um, Mr. McLeese was copied on this. He's aware of it. He's working, last conversation I had with him, he was working through the, the General Assembly, his contacts with the General Assembly, because it still is residing at FEMA, or it's still residing at, uh, at the state level. Uh, Mr. Munn indicated that FEMA has a two-month-plus processing time for the letter of final determination. Once it gets to the feds, they have two-plus months on it. Um, and my note to y'all was that as soon as we get a better date from the, the when that letter is going to go to FEMA, then we will send the letter to the congressional delegation to say, be on the lookout for this. You know, th there's no sense in us sending that letter now because it's nowhere close to being sent to them. And that letter, they forget the letter by then. So as soon as we know when that letter is going out, and Randy has said they will let us know, that we will make that contact congressionally to say, please push this and close that two-month window if you can from the FEMA side. But where it stands right now, uh, according to uh, state EM, uh, they are waiting on, they, they anticipate issuing the revised preliminary maps in September of this year. So. Any, any questions? All right, we're down to items for decision. The uh, first one is a petition to name a road off of Voice of America Road, so Justin, I'll ask you to step back up again. Uh, is there any question, questions of Justin before we uh, approve the name change? What was the recommendation of the planning board? Ponderosa. Ponderosa. Ponderosa Road. Gotcha. If there's no questions, I'll entertain a motion to make that uh, name. So so moved. Motion and a second. All those in favor of the name change, raise your right hand. Okay. All right. Item number two is a petition to name a road off of Carroll Road. Uh, any questions as it relates to that for Justin? That one, the new name would be, or the name would be uh, Lonesome Oak Lane. So moved. All right, motion, second. Second. And a second. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, of the name, raise your right hand. Okay. Thank you very much. And we've handled items number three and items number four. Uh, item number five is the Division of Coastal Management Planning and Management Grant. Uh, Brian? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, as you, the Committee's Commission on behalf of Berkeley County has agreed to apply for a planning grant. It's the 2018-2019 cycle. Through the, uh, yes, sir. Can you bring that mic just a little closer to me? Sure. Through the uh, Division of Coastal Management, um, the primary objective of this planning and management grant is to provide funding to assist local governments in refining uh, and implementing plans for, for management strategies for their coastal resources. Um, what we are seeking funds for is to develop a shoreline stabilization plan for Wrights Creek Recreational Site, 
previous stabilization efforts have been taken have taken place on the site, and this study would evaluate the site and those efforts and establish if additional corrective measures combined with the existing part of grant are needed to provide long-term stabilization. Uh, it is a $20,000 planning grant that we're applying for. It has a $5,000 match uh, for a total of $25,000. Um, the applications are due September 14th, and uh, we'd request your approval to move forward with that. Pending, pending approval of that, we'd come back to you um, and shift some money around to be able to pay that match. Be glad to answer any questions. Uh, questions of uh, Brian. Well, a lot of questions I have. When we paid those people all of that money for that property, I thought that we were told that the toe of the dike was stable and not at risk. And now that we own the property, we're back needing a planning grant to stabilize the dike. I think that the effort of this grant is to look at it and make sure that's the case. Make sure there's not anything else that needs to be done out there. And if there is something to be done, we have a long-term plan that we can go back to the state because they have additional grant money to, to enact things, to take corrective measures that are needed. But we would need a plan to go to them and say, here's the plan that you helped us do. And it says we need to do this if there's something that needs to be done. So we want to put that in place if there's something that needs to be done. And, and it would allow us to chase additional grant money if, we, if it was available. So this grant is just in case the is something that needs to be done. Right, it would evaluate, it would evaluate the property as a whole. Uh, and, and probably both sides, the existing, the existing landing area as well as this piece to look at that entire area and see if there's anything that may need to be done to it. If not, great, we can say we're good. If there is something, it gives us the opportunity to go back to the state and say, here's the plan. Can we apply for grant funding to do these things? Gotcha. Mm -hmm. does, if we get this grant, does that mean that a consultant is actually going to walk the toe of that dike? Or are we going to sit somewhere and write a report? No, no, my, that would go out, and, and it would be a it would be on the ground review of that. It would have to. Be. That's what you call planning. It would be an engineering review, as as far as I understand. Okay, okay. Any anyone else have any question? All right. So moved. Got a motion. Is there a second? Right. Motion and a second. All those in favor of uh, pursuing the uh, coastal management planning and management grant, raise your right hand. Those opposed. Okay. Uh, now, item number six is a request to establish a no-wake zone at Wichert Beach. Uh, that you, Brian? Yes, sir. Um, we were approached, the county was approached by certain residents of the Wichert Beach community requesting assistance to establish a no-wake zone in certain areas out there. They have agreed to pay for the cost associated with that, um, $1,150, which is $400 for the camera permit and $250 for each of the three buoys. You'll see attached the no-wake zoning matrix that was done by NC Wildlife. They went out and looked at it and, and attached their information saying that they recommended these were the certain areas where, there no, where those no-wake buoys be placed. Um, so what we have is a resolution attached that we would request the board's approval on and then that would start the process by which the, res the Wildlife Resources Commission could start the rulemaking process where they would write the rule that says this is a no-wake area then it would go to the Wildlife Commission for their approval and through uh, and to enact that rule and then we would purchase the, um, uh, the, the buoys uh, we would be reimbursed. We have a commitment from the homeowners uh, to reimburse for those. And then wildlife would actually go out and drop the buoys in the place they're supposed to be. And then wildlife would maintain them throughout their life. So move. Okay, we've got a motion. Is second. there a second? Motion is and a second. Any question? All those in favor of moving forward on the uh, no wake zone request at Witcher's Beach, raise your right hand. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, then item number seven, the request for the sheriff to present to the board his notification policy uh, to Mr. Rich. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> this has to do with what uh, John Anderson was in here talking about, and that is the, the inmate who was in the care of the sheriff and was taken to the hospital with sepsis. Uh, he had gone that far and died within a few hours of being taken to the hospital, and the family was never notified. Uh, this is an egregious thing. Uh, it it's just defies human reasoning that anybody would not have the compassion 
when a prisoner is admitted to the hospital to notify the family of, of a serious condition, especially something that's that serious. And I think Mr. Anderson has presented in what he said today, and we have this right here, that within that county uh, uh, medical plan that the sheriff is required by law to have written and to be approved by him and the health director, and I believe he said the county commissioners, although I don't think that thing has ever come to the county commissioners for approval, but that we insert in that plan that the sheriff has the authority that the sheriff shall when a prisoner is admitted to the hospital. I'm not talking about taking to the emergency room. I'm not talking about taking for care, but I, when it's serious enough that the physician thinks the prisoner should be admitted to the hospital, then it's the obligation of the sheriff to notify. And I think Mr. Anderson did a very good job of pointing out the sheriff is the only person that has the information to know who to notify. Consequently, it has to be his responsibility. So I make a motion that we summon the uh, medical plan for the jail and that we insert in the medical plan that the sheriff shall notify when an inmate is admitted to the hospital, shall notify the appropriate people, the designated people. That's a motion. Okay, you before, uh, before I second this. Well, wait, but let's, we got a motion on the floor. Is there a second? And then we'll go into a discussion. Okay, I'll second that motion. All right, we got a second. Now, Commissioner Brent. Okay, Mr. Attorney, have we got the legal right to do that? The last thing I want to do is get involved in a, in a lawsuit. We're already involved in too many. But I want to know, do we have the legal right to put that in the, in the health records? I think with the, with the sheriff's okay, I don't think we have a right to direct it to be done. That's what that letter says to me. That's, so that's for the just sheriff. Because we say, just because we say we want it in there, he don't have to put it in there. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yes. It. Go ahead. Mr. Flagler. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I don't have a problem with making a request, but I, but one thing everybody has to understand, even even if we accomplish what we accomplish, that if the sheriff notifies family that that Johnny Redhead is being admitted to the hospital, visitation would still be under the same guidance as if they were in the jail, and I just want everybody to still understand that. I mean because. There's still some uh, custody problems, but I, I do believe that families should know, even though they can't just everybody say, well, you know, this is my son, this is my sister, this is my brother, and that, that I'm going to see him. That's not going to come into play. I, I'm confident about that, unless the sheriff permits it. And there ain't nobody else who can do anything about that. I just want everybody to, to understand that. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I don't know if, if our, our county attorney can answer this question, but is there any law enforcement considerations when a, when a prisoner is removed from the jail to be placed someplace? Is there any law enforcement considerations that have to be taken into? Is there, you say that again. Is, is what I'm saying is if you remove somebody from the jail and they transport them right. for law enforcement considerations, does that prohibit notification? of non-enforcement individuals. I think this is what I just said. You probably can't answer that question. It's probably an unfair no, question. It's, it's kind of a mixed thing. Uh, I, I think it, it, that alone would not uh, stop a notification from happening. Uh, I think it's just, just a matter of uh, whether, they, whether they want to notify somebody or not. And if, they, if, the, if, if the person is removed to the hospital, they can certainly be notified by the sheriff. And then my next question is, uh, under HIPAA controls and HIPAA recommendations and what you can say and can't say, does this fall under HIPAA requirements? Well, you, if you're taking somebody to a medical facility, because I know in a hospital they can notify the next of kin, whoever the patient list as the next of kin, the hospital can call that person and nobody else. 
So is the sheriff fall under the same HIPAA requirements? But if the sheriff has been mandated, does he fall under HIPAA requirements? Says you cannot call anybody. Well, the, uh, the because in my reading of HIPAA, there is there's just sections in here that talk about law enforcement and what they can and cannot say. By statute, the sheriff who is in charge of the jail is required to maintain uh, the uh, uh, the first the uh, next of kin information. I assume that's an address and phone book, mm -hmm. uh, phone phone number. Uh, and I also assume, although it doesn't say, that uh, they would notify uh, the next of kin in the event that something happens to that individual, that inmate. Uh, that, that seems to, to go without saying, if you will, but it, it is not in the statute. It's what the article in the, in the uh, one of the things the article in the News and Observer was complaining about. And the question they were asking, why wasn't there a notification? Mm -hmm. And the fact is that the statute did not require notification. It requires you to maintain that information, but it doesn't say, and you will do so and so. That's not in the statute. And I know, I know a copy of the index of the SOPs were made available. Nobody's requested those. The, the uh, index was made available, and nobody's requested any of those SOPs. And that's a letter that's referred, I'm referring to a February 22nd, 2018 letter. So I, I'm just saying there's a lot of unknowns here for us to step into something we know nothing about. Nobody's given us what the SOPs say. Nobody's given us, you know, this HIPAA. My reading HIPAA says I get something out of it, but I'm not an attorney. You know, I know it applies to hospitals, but does it also apply to law enforcement? Now, there's sections in HIPAA that talk about law enforcement, but you have to be an attorney to understand it. To me... You know, are we taking a step we know nothing about? Are we playing with half a loaf? Are we playing with one side of the story? Uh, That's all I want to say. I'm done. Okay. Thank Commissioner you. Commissioner B. I just got one question. And, and, and I feel that anybody go to the jail, the family should be notified. But my question to our, our attorney, regardless of what the vote is tonight, is the sheriff, it's up to what the sheriff wants to do. Am I correct? Yes, sir. That Thank was you. my question. Too. Thank you. Any other comment? All right. Call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion that's on the floor, raise your right hand. All those opposed? Okay. Uh, item number eight. Mr. Chairman, before we move on, a little bit of housekeeping that goes with that motion. Uh, when, when can we expect uh, to see some action on this? And who is going to be the point man? We'll make notification to the sheriff of the board's actions tonight, um, as, as soon as we can tomorrow, um, and, and provide him that information. And then, obviously, it's in his court. Well, yeah, and ask him for ask him to uh, please notify us of when he plans to respond. Okay, down to item number eight: the EMS Oversight Committee appointment, uh, Katie. EMS Oversight Committee has an open um, currently in the citizen at large. The appointment would be for three years from effective year and it will expire August 1st, 2021. I have provided you with a potential candidate in your book. Um, and it is up to you when you decide to thank you. So move. Okay, we got a motion. Uh, that person is Laura Long Staten. Is there a second? Second. Okay. No, any any question, comment? The, is this the Miss Staten that lives in uh, uh, Cypress, Landing. Cypress Landing? Yeah, she was on the, uh, she was on the community the college board. Oh yeah, okay. <coughs> college board. Uh, Mr. Chairman, well, let, let's vote first. I want to say something. Okay. Any other comment? All right. All those in favor of uh, that appointment, raise your right hand. Those opposed. Okay. Nay. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Diane Linton, who was a member of that committee since the inception, and uh, as a member at large, and she, I want to thank her on behalf of the, the board. Uh, she did an excellent job, and uh, she should be very proud, and the county should be very proud of what she did 
on the EMS Oversight Committee. And uh, I also want to thank the board for appointing Laura Staten. Uh, she's a physician. Uh, she was a military physician. She was in private practice. Uh, she did emergency medicine. Uh, so she has a, and she's involved in a number of committees and uh, operations throughout the county. So uh, we're replacing one good person with another good person who happens to have a medical background. Thank you. Thank you, board. Okay, item number nine is the ABC board uh, resignation of uh, Curtis Brand and the reappointment of Danny Slade. So, any, any... There's also a third position that they've been. On the ABC board? Okay. Was another one. All right, let's let's take uh, Danny Slade's uh, reappointment for three years. So move. Second. Got a motion. Second. A second. Uh, all those in favor of uh, reappointing Danny Slade, raise your right hand. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, now for the uh, appointment to fill the resignation or the term of Curtis Bryan, who resigned, uh, we have one person that uh, is in our book. Is that right, Katie? So move. Uh, Mr. Sorry. Anthony uh, Tyre. All right, motion and a second. Mr. Chairman. Yes. As a matter of I want to come in after we vote. Okay. All right, we've got a motion and a second. All those, any other comment? Okay. All those in favor of uh, Mr. Tyre, raise your right hand. Okay. Yes, sir. Commissioner Well, Richard. what I'd like to say is these vacancies that we're talking about and we're filling tonight, uh, I don't know if there were vacancies. Commissioners don't know their vacancies. People are slipping in and getting their buds put into these things, and they fill out the application, they get somebody to fill it out, and then it's you're off and running. I think these things ought to be out there for at least a month. Commissioners, all the commissioners should be notified before these appointments are made. I don't know about we you, Mr. Richardson, but appointment. I was. I think this has been out there about a month. Yeah, oh, some of these have been out there, but most of these have not been out there. Not all of these have been out there. I I think we had an email on Curtis Bryant and also we on uh, Danny Slade. Danny Slade. Right. We did. Well, I just said not all of these appointments have been out there. They need to be. You're just speaking in general. That's right. Okay. Okay. General statement. <laughs> okay, we're down to item number ten, which is the bid and offer to purchase property. Uh, David, well, gentlemen, you see that we've got uh, six offers. I uh, will point out to you that the sixth one. The Oak Drive property has already been upset. It was a $500 offer. It's now at $700. That was today, I think. Yeah. Oak Drive. Uh, it was ups upset today. So you have six there. Uh, again, if, if you are inclined to approve these offers, this is the bottom number. It will be no lower than this, subject to any increase in bid. They will ultimately be publicized in the daily news to seek increased bids. Beyond at at this numbers. point, they've not been advertised in the paper. They have That's the next step. Yes. Okay. That's why you vote. Yes. Uh, David, does, um, does that about finish up our, our property? Uh, it goes and comes. You'll we never down, finish. We were down to one. <laughs> never. never. Uh, I think you'll never be completely finished. But I, we were down to one uh, about a month ago. And then suddenly we've got, well, there were six right here. So it, it depends on foreclosures and other things that happen. Gotcha. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I have a client who's bidding on these lots, and I would like for the board to excuse me from having to vote on these. Okay. Uh, entertain a motion. We've got a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion and a second. All those in favor of allowing uh, Commissioner Richardson to pass on voting on this, raise your right hand. Okay. Make a motion to set the office for the property. All right. Got a motion. Second. And a second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the uh, motion, raise your right hand. Thank you. All right. We're down to closed session. And I'll ask the... Uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll back up on your uh, couple of consent items. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm yep. sorry. we got three. Yeah, item number two, the purchase order and project carry forward. 
Mr. Richardson. Well, this this is, you know, we're talking about not a small amount of money here, and I've got to put my glasses on to even see the amount of money. The total is $422,000, and this is purchase order project carry forward. I have complained about this before because we're two months into the new year, and now all of a sudden we have people walking in here, here saying, gee, we didn't spend all the money we were supposed to spend last year, so we want you to carry these projects forward because we couldn't get our job done. And that that is a that is a problem with me uh, because I've requested to be notified by the finance department at the end of the year of the purchase orders that were being carried forward and there's no really no excuse for this because managers who are running departments and don't know what they're carrying forward as a purchase order really need to seek employment somewhere else mm -hmm. because this is a matter of management so one of the questions that I have for the finance officer is, what is the source of the funds for this? Um, the source Actually, of let, let me address that. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, um, these are purchase orders that the board has approved previously in a prior year. You are under a legal obligation to fund those. The, the money is the money that was appropriated last year, and because it wasn't spent, it would have rolled the fund balance to begin with. This simply moves that money forward into the new fiscal year. It's not new money. It's not new money. It's money that's previously been legally obligated by this board that you have to pay. Is that, that, is that earmarked? That money earmarked? That, that money is earmarked? Yeah, I mean, it, yes, it's through those departments, through those line items that were previously approved as purchase orders. It's like the ambulance. The ambulance came in day before yesterday. So we've made that we've made that final purchase, but we have to bring it forward because it's in the new year when it's actually being paid. That's so there's there's nothing untoward about this. It is just a normal operation when you have items that don't get completed at the end of the year because that purchase order has been issued. Well, I agree. There's nothing untoward in this at all. It's a matter of management philosophy of the board. I, as a member of the board, don't want to sit here and approve a budget when I got $400,000 hung over from last year. You would never get away with this in the industry. You know, you, they would show you the door. When, when this hit the desk, you'd say, well, there's the door right there. Because it's your job to keep the board informed at the end of the budget year. Now, I'm fully aware that in government, the books never close. And this is a great example of the books never closing. Uh, uh, there are items in here that, that if the money is not spent, I think this board should ask itself the question, because this money is legally obligated, legal, legally obligated is when the purchase order is signed, there, there needs to be a closing date on that purchase order too. We're, we're just talking about management philosophy here, and it's my philosophy probably differs from the board and everybody else around here, and that's why taxes keep going up. Uh, so, Nelson Mullins and Scarborough, legal representation, governing board, $31,277. What is that for? That is for the lawsuit. On what? On the public record, on the public, um, the one that the citizen, the Larry. three Larry, 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 Larry where, where, oh, oh, your buddy. Okay, where we're being accused of violating the, um, the, the closed session laws? That's correct. Okay, but see... I don't understand why this can't be cut off at the end of the budget year and say, look, you need to get your invoice in here before a certain date. Otherwise, you're not going to get paid because the board has to reauthorize this for the coming year. I, 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 just, I just think this is not the way to do it. The Mideast uh, Planning Department, you know, they can get their invoice in before the end of the year and get paid. There's no reason that they can't. That's a bicycle pedestrian grant. Well, that's the... Well, that's what we're, uh, okay, is that what we're voting? Did we vote on that Back it up now. <laughs> tonight? No, sir. You no, no, voted no, on no. the last meeting, but we haven't received the funds yet from the, from the state. So this is the purchase order that was, that was obligated for that. When the board approved doing that work, this is the purchase order that pays for that grant. So as well, soon as we get the funds from the state, it goes back to them. Well, in closing out books and cleaning up books, why can't they get their invoice in here and we pay them? We're going to get our money later on. They haven't they done the work done yet. More. Haven't done the work yet. The work is not completed. Then it should have been rolled into the coming budget. This is what we're doing. We're rolling it into the current. No, 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 we're not. No, we're not. Because I'm going to go back to a question that we need to get cleared up on. 
where is are the funds coming from to pay this four hundred twenty two thousand dollars some of it is coming from prior year funds that weren't expended and some of it's coming from grant funding the, the $45,000 okay. grant funding. The summary is at the bottom. Well, what I'm saying the is the books never closed because we're still coming, carrying out the 2017 budget. Now, the books did close. The books have closed for the last year. For the last fiscal year, the books have closed. That's why this is being brought forward and it's being, it, it's being put into this fiscal year. This money is not going to show up in this year's budget at all as an expenditure. When we take our total budget for this business year, this is not going to show up in there. It will. It, it will be expended in this fiscal year, so yes, it will show up in there. When you do the totals for the budget for the year, then we need a budget ordinance to increase the budget for this for the year that we're in. Page 16. Page 16. Okay, I'm going to entertain a motion to Mr. Chairman, approve the uh, purchase I would like to be able to call to the public's attention the amounts of money that are being spent for some of this stuff here. Now, if you want to cut me off and tell me to shut up, why don't you just do that? Well, I, I, we went through this same exercise last year, and uh, I don't know what it is that you don't get about this. Mm. I mean, you, you claim to be a business mm. person, mm -hmm. and apparently you or not familiar with the accounting. Oh, yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm afraid yeah. that I am familiar with the accounting. Why don't, why don't you just go right to the total? Well, it's $422,000, right. but it's it's a telephone fund. Uh, part of the money is coming out of a telephone fund. Part of it is for a well and pump company, $38,000. Uh, the operation and of a uh, laboratory at the Institute for Transportation Research and Education. What is that for? That's the school planning grant. That's yes. the school planning grant. Yes. Okay. Did you vote for that? I did. And yeah. I support and, that. And every item every item on here has already been approved by this board. But the, the work was not complete and we had a purchase order. So we're just paying it when it's due. But we're gonna write a check out of the general fund, aren't we? You know yes. Well, some yeah. of it. Some, so if you so the fund balance is going to go down. Well, guess what? Right. If it was written on June the 30th, it would have the same effect. No. Well, I know you don't get that. <laughs> I know you what don't I'm get that. What I'm saying is you need to know what's going on if you're going to manage anything. And with, with this stuff coming up after the end of the year and no notice at the end of the year of we're carrying forward these purchase orders, all you have to do is the same thing that I asked for last year. Give me a list of the purchase orders you're carrying forward when we complete the budget at the end of June. That is what we're doing. Okay. No, do give it at the end of June. I, we're we unable to tell you that at June 30th. Then you got a sorry system of books. I'm, I'm okay. sorry you feel gentlemen, that way. Gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen, I'm going to cut it off. I'm ready for a motion. So moved. All right, a motion. Second. Is there a second? All right, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Those opposed. All right. Mr. Chairman, can I ask the you one question? Uh, let's move to the next yeah. item. I mean, I... I just want to ask him if we have, an, if we have a, a 101 accounting class that the county can offer for any who have it to take it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think I need to take it. All right. I think so. We're down to item number three, the purchase order and contracts over 20000 Commissioner Richardson. Item number three. Yeah. Is that on page 18? Uh, page 18. Okay, the, we've got the a bicycle plan. Is that in this year's budget? It is now. You, they just voted to move it to the current year. Who just voted? This board. When was that? Um, the previous item. We just spoke about it. It's the bike plan. So they moved it to this year from last year. Yes, it's, okay. it's purely a timing issue. It, it completed last year, so we're asking you to bring it forward to the current year. Well, you know, from the standpoint of management, if you know what your open purchase orders are, you know whether people are hustling and doing their jobs or not. Are you going to say anything new this time, or is it going to be the same stuff again? Would you like to debate? Huh? Would you like a debate? Uh, so far, you. I'm not you anywhere, anytime, and you may. So not far, you've not you've not come up with anything new. Well, your criticism. Yes, I did. I just came up with something new. Knowing what your purchase, to the purchase point. Are, are get to your point, Commissioner Richards. Because you disagree doesn't get mean to the it's point. not a point. Get to the point, so we can take a vote. 
<laughs> if you've got something new, well, I got that's some, fine. That was new right there because somebody didn't see that it was done last year, didn't put it on the list, didn't properly carry it forward, which it could have been done at the end of the year. Here because again. they didn't know what was going on because they weren't watching. Here again, to be a commissioner for 21 years, I'm sorry. Here's the, not no, I've been a commissioner now for 23 years. Let me mention one other thing here. Purchase order on the next page. Why are we, why are we buying 65 cell phones at a cost of $770 per cell phone for the social services department. Um, we're not purchasing the phones. This is the service contract for the. We've already purchased the phones. It's the service contract for the phones. Yes, but we already own the phones. They provide the phones as part of the contract. And we pay them uh, seven hundred and seventy dollars a year. It's sixty-four dollars a month per phone. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. Let's see. We're paying sixty-four dollars a month for a cell phone for maintenance on a cell phone. Are we paying a, a fee to a, to the phone to the provider of the service? It's, is that, it's a is monthly the service. The service. Yeah. But so it, does that include the broadband fee for the yes. operation of the phone? Yes, sir. So it's really it's really the cell phone service that we are paying for. It's not for we're not buying a phone. We, we don't pay any additional phone bill with these phones no, to anybody. That's right. That's right. This is 100% of it. That's right. Yes. Well, the next question, I guess, is why do 65 people need cell phones in the social services department? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, you only have 120 employees over there, so one, ever, one out of every two people has a phone to be communicating with somebody that has to be of earth-shattering importance. The, the, the DSS employees that are out in the field, they're doing home visits, uh, they use that phone. They also it's also tied in with the tethering plan so that they can use their laptop to, to do home intake work and reports and those kind of things. So it helps them stay in the field doing their job without having to come back to the office to sit down and, and have access. We have sixty five people system. in the field. I don't know the exact number. You'd have to ask Ms. Corpru exactly the number that's broken out. <coughs> but but this is this is consistent with what they have done for years. Well, see what I'm telling you about looking at these purchase orders and examining these purchase orders because you find out all kinds of amazing things when you do this. Okay, let's get down to the amazing vote. All those in favor, well, let's see, we need a motion first. A motion. So move. Motion and a second. All right, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Those opposed. All right. Uh, we got one more, uh, the approval of the August minutes and the 2018 budget workshop minutes. Okay, i can tell you what my comment is on that. It, you know, the, August, the, the workshop, the budget workshop minutes were held in like, what, February? You know, we really, uh, you, you shouldn't approve these minutes. We've, we've done the budget. The workshop is over with. The minutes mean nothing. You know, the, all the, it's this is this is a waste of time. The minutes should have already been in here for approval. They shouldn't be coming in after you do the budget. Then you're going to approve your budget workshop minutes. Again, you get back to to management practice. We should have had a better management practice, and that's that's my comment on this. Okay. All those so uh, we need a motion. So second. A motion and a second to approve the minutes of both August and the uh, budget workshops. All those in favor of approval, raise your right hand. Those opposed? All right, we're down to the last item, which is the closed session. And I'll ask Katie to read us into closed session. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Before you go into that, I was the one that requested that this item be put on the agenda. Now, it may have been going to be put in there anyway, unbeknownst to me, but I can tell you what my question is, and it has nothing to do with confidentiality. This lawsuit has been going on for almost two years. It's costing us money every month. When is it going to trial? When are we going to get this over with? Mr. Attorney, do you have any indication of when this may go to trial? Yes, sir, I have some indication. I can't tell you exactly uh, when that will be. It certainly will not be in the next two weeks. We don't have a civil session of court until uh, uh, I believe it might be October um, and I'm not sure that the assigned judge uh, will hear this matter he is our resident judge 
has been assigned to that, and that's the, the next civil term. This uh, this calendar only goes to December 31st, um, so it will be after the first of the year before it comes up on the civil calendar. My guess would be in January. I can uh, I can state this is there's nothing uh, on this particular subject uh, that is uh, attorney client related at least at, at for this this part of it um, we you have have filed a motion for summary judgment which was I took over and personally filed it Friday afternoon uh, over here so we have filed a motion seeking summary judgment uh, I have a copy for each of you if you'd like this is public information now that it's been filed and if you would like to have a copy of I'd like a copy. I, I will I will give you a copy um, to, to any of you uh, but what what this what this says just to tell you what it says uh, is that uh, we are moving the court for summary judgment uh, in our favor on all claims alleged against them that is us in this action on the grounds of, that the pleadings affidavits and all matters of record show that there is no genuine issue as to any material fact and defendants are entitled to judgment as a matter of law. Uh, in support thereof, defendants show the following. Uh, one, on or about April 13, 2017, plaintiffs filed their original complaint seeking declaratory judgment as to rights, duties, and responsibilities of the party with regard to North Carolina Open Meetings Act, NC General Statute Section 143.318.9 at seek, and issuance of a, uh, and they were also seeking, an issuance of preliminary injunction, quote, to prevent the reoccurrence of past violations and for continuing violations of the same. Two, on or about September 20, 2017, plaintiffs filed their amended complaint seeking, again seeking a declaratory judgment as to rights, duties, and responsibilities of the parties with regard to the North Carolina Open Meetings Law in C General Staff 143 and seek an issuance of a preliminary injunction. Uh, quote, to, uh, to prevent the recurrence of past violations and for continuing violations of the same. Three, this is what we say, there is no genuine issue of material fact as to any violation of the Open Meetings Act by defendants as alleged in their uh, complaint. Further, even if a violation were found to have occurred, it would not warrant the injunctive, re injunctive relief that plaintiffs seek Four, in support of this motion, defendants further rely upon the following. A, defendants' responses to plaintiffs' first set of interrogatories and request for production of documents dated March 21, 2018. You'll recall that we went through those and we signed them. B, defendants' first supplemental responses to plaintiffs' first set of interrogatories and requests for production of documents dated March 24, 2018. C, Document numbers BCC 0001-146, produced by defendants on April the 30th, 2018, in response to plaintiff's request for production of documents. And D, affidavit of Kathleen Mosher, clerk of the Board of Commissioners, dated September 6, 2018, which was also filed. Wherefore, defendants respectfully pray the court to enter summary judgment in their favor and for such other and further relief as to the court deems just and proper. Respectfully submitted the 7th day of November, I'm sorry, of September 2018, Nelson Mullis, Riley, and Scarborough, LLP by D. Martin Warren. The attached affidavit states this, and this is of Ms. Mosher. I am over the age of majority, am under no legal disability, and am otherwise competent to provide testimony in this proceeding. <clears throat> I am employed by Beaufort County in the position of clerk to the Board of Commissioners. If called as a witness, I would offer testimony consistent with the content of this affidavit. The matter set forth in this affidavit are made based on my personal knowledge and based on a review of the official records of the Beaufort County Board of Commissioners, particularly the minutes of the board meetings, 
which stands, which records are kept in the regular course of Beaufort County's business and is a regular practice of Beaufort County. Each of the following statements is true and correct to the best of my knowledge. This is why we have minutes. Uh, two, I have reviewed the minutes and materials associated with the June 1, July 7, August 3, and August 5, 2018, and August 2016 meetings of the Beaufort County Board of Commissioners. You might recall those are the dates that were brought up in the complaint and that we answered to. Uh, brought it, say the Board of Commissioners at issue <clears throat> excuse me, at issues in this action and found them to be true and accurate copies of the minutes on file with Beaufort County. Further, the copies of these minutes, of those minutes and materials produced to counsel for the board in discovery appear to be true and accurate copies. Three, I have reviewed the minutes associated with regularly scheduled meetings from August 2016 to present for the purposes of identifying each time the Beaufort County Board of Commissioners has gone into closed session and to determine by examination of the records whether any objection from the public from the public attending the meeting was raised either at the meeting or afterwards. Four, to the best of my review, it would appear the board has gone into closed session ten times since the August 2016 meeting. Of those ten times, upon information and belief, no objections were raised either at or after the meeting by the members of the public. Five, it is the custom and practice of the Beaufort County Board of Commissioners to identify a statute or privilege from allowing a closed session meeting while reading the board into the closed session or in the agenda for a particular meeting. Furthermore, a fiance saith not this the sixth day of September 2018. Uh, that is the uh, motion and the, uh, the attachment uh, to the motion. As I've said, this, this is not uh, going to come up immediately. It will come up in the regular course of business uh, by the court, uh, which will be, in my opinion, it will be after uh, January 1 to answer that question. Is there anything left that's attorney-client? There that are several things that I want to bring to your attention, yes. As attorney-client? Yes. Okay. And, and actually deal with several other things that, are, that have come up very recently and that are pending, and I just wanted to keep you informed of those. Okay. Katie? Katie, would you read us in the closed session? Motion is needed to go into closed session under NCGS 143-318-11A3 to consult with an attorney and for a retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body and for discussion of existing litigation, Larry B. Board of Commissioners, 17 CBS 313. Okay, now we're only going to be discussing Larry versus no, Board of Commissioners. I'm, I'm getting ready to tell you what else there is. In addition to Larry versus the board members uh, that we've already identified, in, in the event that you have any questions about that that we can discuss in closed sessions, uh, there's also the matter of the NAACP versus Beaufort County Board of Elections uh, and in re grand jury subpoenas to the election boards of Beaufort County Board of, uh, board of Elections. This has just come up this past week. Um, and you need to know about this, in my opinion. And we also, I also want to advise you of a claim that has come up that there is no lawsuit filed, so we do not have a title. Uh, just to tell you, it is a claim that's come up, uh, and I need to tell you about that. We'll find out more about it in the future. Okay. Can I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. All right. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Okay, uh, coming out of uh, closed session, there will be no action taken. Uh, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to so adjourn. Moved. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor of adjourning, raise your right hand. Everybody be safe. Yeah.